Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's C3 AI Digital Transformation Institute seminar series. So the C3 AI DTI mission is to attract the world's leading scientists in a coordinated and innovative effort to advance the digital transformation of business, governments, and society. And this weekly seminar features research that is interdisciplinary and especially at the heart of the joint work of machine learning uh, sciences and engineering uh, fields. So I want to uh, pause here to sincerely um, appreciate our gratitude to our academic partners, um, as well as the industry partners and also the computing supports. Um, so we have a very uh, exciting seminar series for the spring semester of 2022 um, on the incentive design and learning for societal systems. So uh, we, we have five talks, including today's ones um, left for this semester. Uh, you can find the information of the speakers as well as their talk title and abstracts on, on our website. Uh, we have also had uh, quite a few amazing uh, speakers, um, and you can find their talk videos and slides on our, on our website if you have missed them. Um, the best way to make sure that you don't miss our talks is to subscribe to our newsletters and also to follow us on the YouTube channel. Uh, today, today, we are very... Um, okay, so today we are very excited to have Professor Adam Wellman. Uh, he is going to present his work on online optimization and control using black box predictions. Uh, professor Wellman is a professor in the Department of Computing and Mathematical Sciences at the Caltech um, uh, California Institute of Technology. Um, he is the director of the Information Science and Technology Initiative and served as the department chair of CMS from 2015 to 2020. Um, additionally, he also serves as um, advisory boards of the Lee Institute of Economics and Management Science and the Sunlight to Everything Trust in the Resnick Institute for Sustainability. Um, he received his PhD, Master of Sciences and Bachelor of Sciences in Computer Science from Carnegie Mellon University in 2007, 2004, and 2001. Um, he has been a faculty member at Caltech uh, since 2007. Um, so the format of this seminar is that we will have 15 minutes of presentation um, and followed with 10 minutes of Q&A. Uh, please submit your questions through the Q&A sessions to ask your questions. Uh, we will try to um, answer those questions for you. Uh, we will try to ask those questions for you and answer them um, as much as we can for the rest of the talk. Um, okay, so without, um, with no further delay, um, Adam, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for that introduction. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll get my slide sharing here uh, right now. Um, so uh, while I know it's hard to be interactive in this sort of uh, experience, oh, Sorry, can everybody hear me? It seems like maybe. Yes, something. we can hear you. Okay. Slide is not in the projected mode. Yeah, my computer, it seems like is uh, having some problems here. Oh. Um, Okay, uh, I'm back. I uh, hopefully this time it will work. Let me try sharing again. Um, okay, are you seeing my slides in presentation mode now? Uh, yes, it's good now. Okay, perfect. So sorry about that mix up. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so it's hard to be interactive in these things, uh, but I would love to have 
questions uh, during the talk, uh, if possible. And so I will pause a few times during the talk, especially you know as I transition from topic to topic and try to give uh, folks the chance to uh, ask questions uh, when they're relevant in the talk route rather than waiting and holding all questions to the end. So please go ahead and put, uh, put your questions in the Q&A and I'll, I'll keep an eye uh, out there as we're going. Um, so th this work is uh, pretty recent work. It's, it's a lot of work that's been going on in our lab in the last year. And it's uh, something that we're really excited about and something that I think is a kind of emerging approach to thinking about how to use uh, AI tools in safety critical systems. And so, you know, the, my goal today isn't to give you the nitty gritty of uh, particular results or particular problems here, but is rather to kind of motivate a uh, new style of uh, asking questions algorithmically uh, in this domain and a new approach for uh, getting guarantees on the use of uh, AI tools in, in safety critical systems. Uh, and so with that, I'll, I'll jump in um, and uh, get started. So, so like I said, you know, the, the motivation here is, you know, AI tools have a huge potential uh, for improving efficiency, reliability, responsiveness of infrastructure systems like smart grid, transportation, and, and many more. Uh, and you know, this has led to a lot of excitement, but it's also led to a lot of hesitation. Uh, and I think there are, you know, at this point, a large, uh, you know, a, a large amount of both, you know, excitement and hesitation in, in this area. And, you know, I, I love this example. It's a little bit old at this point, but this really, you know, I think makes very salient the the hesitation many uh, in industry, especially feel about the adopt adoption of uh, of these AI tools in safety critical systems, where, you know, the left is a picture of a stop sign that, you know, without the tape, uh, a vision, you know, tool could be uh, very reliably recognized as a, as a stop sign. And this group a few years ago was able to kind of highlight adversarial examples where with strategically placed pieces of tape on the stop sign, all of a sudden the vision system thinks that that stop sign looks like a speed limit sign. And of course, this is a disaster if this happens for an autonomous vehicle at an intersection. Uh, and so, you know, things like this that are kind of seemingly unusual, unexplainable variations leading to wildly wrong predictions from the AI tools lead to a lot of uh, embarrassing failures in these safety critical systems. And, you know, that was one example, but you can kind of, you know, just comb the headlines for many more uh, places where uh, something unexpected shows up in a kind of real large scale safety critical system and leads to problems that can have you know significant impact uh, for you know the world for society uh, and so you know in some sense may, maybe said succinctly uh, a key barrier for these tools in these infrastructure systems these safety critical areas is that you just can't afford to fail at scale uh, with the adoption of these tools. And this leads to kind of a common refrain in a lot of these uh, industrial areas where the, you know, the higher ups in the companies or, or you know, the you know, utilities, for example, in, in smart grid really want to make use of these new tools, these modern tools and machine learning. Uh, but you know, and their teams often want to as well. So there's a lot of work within their teams, you know, proposing these frameworks. But at the end of the day, when the, you know, the results bubble up and a decision needs to be made, they need to find some way of having guarantees on what happens in the bad cases uh, for these tools. And if they don't have those guarantees, they can't deploy uh, the new ideas. Uh, and so this is a, a really common refrain that we've uh, dealt with with a lot of our industry partners at Caltech. And so uh, we're very we're very used to hearing this. Uh, and you know, one really concrete example in an area that I've worked in a lot over the years is uh, data center design, and in particular, uh, carbon centric data center design, where the idea is to try to make uh, compute more sustainable by doing work uh, at times and places where there's renewable energy readily available, and doing the workload and resource migration to make needed to make that possible. Uh, and this is really a reality now. So Anna. Uh, is leading a team at Google that uh, you know has this mission and is deploying these ideas, uh, and you know the in in cartoon form or animation form. This is from the Google blog. Uh, this animation you can see like 
if you can adapt and move workload to places where the wind is blowing uh, and the sol and solar is blowing, then you can really uh, limit the carbon impact, uh, the carbon footprint uh, of data center, you know, uh, tool, data center workloads, data center energy demand, which you know is a big deal. Uh, and this is clearly a place where AI tools can be very impactful potentially, because you can predict the workload uh, demands, uh, where and when they're going to hit, the renewable energy, where and when they're going to hit, the efficiency of the grid, the opportunities for doing this. Like this is a you know a very stereotypical prediction task. And actually within Google, this is something that has received a lot of attention and, and you know has been shown to be very successful. Uh, and so you have a team working on deploying these things within Google, and you also have teams working on doing predictions within Google. And yet, uh, still, you can't afford to fail at scale in, in the system, and so these MLAI tools are not what are being used by the systems that are being deployed for doing this carbon-centric computing. Uh, and I really, again, the situation is you can't afford to have a misprediction lead to workload performance degradation, and so you can't afford to deploy something without guarantees. Uh, and you know to really make that very concrete, this is now uh, numerics done with a simulator within our lab, uh, where we have kind of capacity provisioning in a carbon-centric data center where there's on-site solar and energy storage, and you're trying to you know manage that in a way to reduce re, uh, reduce your carbon footprint while still meet performance guarantees. Uh, and you know the the to explain the axes here, we have the cost of the data center on the Y, and we have uh, distribution shift between training and uh, testing of the algorithms uh, on the x-axis. And so, you know, the, the case where the AI tool is designed, you know, the, the deployment matches the uh, training is this distribution shift of zero. And you can see, you know, a significant improvement in cost here. Uh, maybe not the 40%, but something very significant in this particular realistic workload. Uh, and yet, in this place where there's some mismatch for whatever reason, you see, you know, enormous degradation. Uh, and this is the problem, right? So if you're going to deploy these tools and you're worried about this degradation, you can't do it for a safety critical system. Uh, and so it's not worth it to risk this degradation in order to achieve this gain. Uh, and so, you know, the goal, what you'd, what you'd love to see in this situation is something more like this, where you have that opportunity to get the win uh, from the AI tools, but you have something in place that limits the risk in the case where there is a big distribution shift or something else goes wrong in terms of these unexpected uh, outcomes from the AI tools. And so you need the robustness to be able to handle that kind of uh, unexpected behavior while still getting the efficiency from the uh, win when things work well. Uh, and so that that question, that goal, is really the driving point behind the research that I'm talking about today, and not not just in our group broadly, uh, you know, in this field. Uh, it's really, you know, can guarantees required by safety critical applications be enforced by these modern AI ML tools? Uh, and so, you know, in a caricature form, uh, the typical Pareto optimal curve. You know, right now we're in a situation where you know, for performance, the black box AI ML tools can be better, uh, but there's a robustness, robustness hit that you take if you adopt those, whereas the traditional control online algorithms type tools, you know, give up a little bit in perform terms of performance, but are designed for robustness and safety inherently in terms of the, the way we've tr traditionally designed those tools. Uh, and so, you know, the goal, of course, uh, going forward is to find some way, some tools uh, with which we can get the benefits of the black box AI performance gains, but still keep as much as possible of the safety and robustness. And of course, you'd love to be way out here where you're getting the best of both worlds. And the question is kind of where is that, you know, what, what is achievable? Uh, that, that's the research question uh, for this sort of area. Um, and, you know, oftentimes this in the, in the learning lingo is, you know, thought of as like model free approaches versus model based approaches and, and model based approaches are, are needed to get these safety and robustness guarantees, but model free approaches can have a big win in terms of performance. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a field that's emerged 
uh, at this point that's you know the interface of learning and control that really goes after you know wide variety of ways of combining these kind of model free and model based approaches uh, so if you're interested in this topic you know the i'd say the main conference that has emerged at this point is l4dc learning for Dis dynamics and control uh, which is a really you know great place to go and look at you know, what's coming out of this community uh, each year uh, and then over the last two three years there's just been an enormous number of workshops at various math uh, institutes like ipam uh, and aim and also there's been a, you know a, a growth of online uh, seminar series uh, really focused on this direct topic including this one control meets learning that we organized at caltech during the during the peak of the pandemic um, and you know out of these out of this community there's just been uh, a wide variety of techniques that have uh, slowly been emerging often in the context of specific applications where you can take advantage of specific structure in those applications uh, and they you know tend to take the form of you know looking at some you know modern tool like rl or deep rl or something or policy learning things like this and taking some uh, technique in the control or online algorithms literature and merging the two. So like Lyapunov based policy learning, where you take advantage of, you know, learning or uh, Lyapunov structure underlying the, the space uh, to guide uh, the, the model free tools so that you get a stability guarantee as well as, well as the performance uh, from the model free approaches. And so there's a wide variety of those sort of, you know, learning plus control techniques. And then more broadly, uh, you know, in the learning community, there are things like adversarial testing and, and system verification that have come up as ways to you know not necessarily merge with learning tools but with to add guarantees on top of uh these sorts of more model free based techniques that are tend to emerge in the black box ai tool set um, so there's a lot coming out and a lot of this uh, a lot of the, these techniques tend to sort of grab from one field or the other and, and combine them or in a you know application specific way uh but in you know the last year or so there's uh, been a few different techniques that are much more general emerging, like in the adversarial testing world and in the Lyapunov based learning world. Uh, and the talk today that I'm giving is about one of those new approaches that we've been working a lot at Caltech and that we're really, we think is a, is a really powerful and very general approach for trying to get the best of both worlds from, from these tool sets. Uh, and I, I refer this to this as sort of a, a K experts approach for getting the best of both worlds. And, and what I mean by that, coming back to my cartoon here, is that uh, I wanna find a way of you know, getting the best of both worlds without getting into the nitty gritty of how the AI tools are working, how the algorithms are working, because once you get into there, you immediately become very problem or domain specific. Uh, and so instead of taking that approach, uh, what we've been looking at uh, is a, this style of work where you take the output of each of these tools and you treat them as an expert giving you advice on what to do. And so, you know, the traditional design for the system is your trusted expert. These are designs that come with guarantees, whether it be about performance or worst case performance or stability or things like this. So they come with guarantees. So we call them trusted experts. Uh, and then you have untrusted experts, which are the black box tools, uh, you know, the AI and all things that don't have guarantees on how they're going to do, but often perform very well. Uh, and the idea is to say, you know, uh, me as the, you know, algorithm, I'm going to take the advice from the trusted, untrusted expert and the advice from the trusted expert. Each of them is giving me an action that I could choose to do or not. Uh, and then I'm going to combine those two actions in some way. Uh, and the output of that is going to be my algorithm. Uh, and the hope is that that output can be constructed in a way where I get the best of both worlds. I maintain something like the guarantee of the trusted expert while also getting nearly the same performance in the best case as the untrusted expert. So to make that really concrete, for the, there's many ways one could frame trusted experts and untrusted experts and robustness and performance uh, in the sort of cartoon on the previous slide. For this talk, I'm going to take a very concrete version, uh, which is adversarial uh, and come, falls into the competitive analysis framework, particularly the bi-competitive analysis framework, since we care about two guarantees. Uh, and this is referred to as robustness and consistency, where consistency captures the idea that you want to do as well as the black box AI, 
uh, in particular, you want to do as well when the black box AI does well. Uh, and so this says that in an adversarial sense on every sample path, uh, you nearly match the performance of the untrusted expert. And so that means that your cost is, you know, one plus delta times the cost of the untrusted expert on every sample path, every instance of the problem. And, you know, this only binds if the untrusted expert does well. If the untrusted expert is terrible, this is trivially satisfied. So this means that when the untrusted expert does well, when you're getting good performance from your black box AI, uh, you're getting nearly as good a performance from your uh, algorithm, your, your K-experts combination of the black box AI with the trusted expert. Uh, so that's consistency. And robustness says that, well, you know, we want to not, we want to have a guarantee that says adversarially, we're always within, say, some constant factor, which is the competitive ratio, uh, this gamma of the offline optimal if we knew everything. And this means that we can never be too bad. Yeah, this might, this gamma might be much larger than the, you know, what the untrusted advice was giving. But even if that untrusted advice is really bad, we're still never going to be hurt too much because we maintain this competitive bound. Uh, and ideally, this competitive bound should be close in some sense to what you could have done with a trusted expert uh, if you had ignored the advice from the untrusted expert entirely. So if you didn't have the black box AI to work with, you would get a competitive ratio of gamma trusted. You want the gamma of your algorithm to be near that in some sense. So that's robustness versus consistency uh, in this framework. And I think actually this is a good place where I've, when I've given this talk before to stop and say, you know, is this framework clear? Because in a large extent, the, the goal of this talk is to illustrate this framework with a few examples and talk about algorithmic design in this framework. But I really think that, you know, what I hope is that this framework uh, can be, you know, something that uh, is interesting and uh, for everybody and maybe that you find use in for in your own work. Hey Adam, uh, uh, I have a question. Um, so you assume you're gonna define what an expert is, what are they providing input about? Yeah, so this is the, the I'll define it in a problem specific way, but think of this as the action that you're gonna take as the algorithm. So each of them is suggesting an action for you to take right now. Oh, okay. Uh, that's that's the that's the way to concrete. So you know they're each suggesting an action. If you picked the untrusted expert, that would be like running the AI. If you took the trusted expert, that's what you were doing before. You want to combine them in some way so that you get the guarantees of both. Uh, okay. And then oh, go ahead. Yeah, Ben, great. Yeah, hi. So who decide who are the trusted experts? So you assume there's a prior information that. Some experts are trusted. Oh, how about yeah. I have, you know, a certain probability trust is expert, not just a hard yes or no. Yeah, that's great. That's a great question. So in this talk, I'm assuming that you have a guarantee on trusted, uh, which is sort of of this form. Like you, you have an algorithm that in the worst case is, you know, guarantees you a competitive ratio or a regret bound or whatever it is. And this is, you know, known to you when you're designing your algorithm, that that algorithm exists and that that algorithm has a guarantee. You don't care how the algorithms work. We're going to treat the algorithms as a black box, but you know that it has a particular guarantee on it. Uh, and so the way the way that I think about this, the way we've deployed it with in, in practice is basically, you know, the you have a system that's working for you now that you trust and that has some guarantee for you. You want to, uh, you know, that that's one of, that's your trusted expert. And so, you know, which is the trusted expert and how much trust to place in it. But it's a really interesting question going forward to say, you know, probabilistic trust, uh, for example. But actually, you know, that's a that's a good bridge to my like animation here where. You know, I think a key con contrast to say the like bandits literature, which you know that your question really connects with, is that uh, you know there oftentimes maybe you have some probabilistic information about arms ahead of time, especially in the Bayesian versions. Uh, and here we really want this to be a performance bound for the algorithm that you know ahead of time. Uh, so that's what we mean by trust. It's not like uh, a particular myopic cost uh, uh, trust. It's a, you know, if you use this algorithm, your performance is going to be safe or stable or bounded in, you know, concretely by a competitive ratio of gamma trusted. And I see another one in the QA, Q and A. So the question from Katie is how do you quantify when trusted expert do or don't do well? 
Uh, and so this is like a proof, like you have a proof ahead of time, a guarantee on that algorithm uh, to say uh, that it's trusted. That, that's the framework. And we want to somehow take that guarantee on a trusted algorithm and port it over to get a guarantee for our black box AI or for our variation of the black box AI. Okay, and so to make it even to drive a point home of like why you, why you need this sort of thing, uh, a good example is MPC model predictive control from the control literature, uh, and so this is an algorithm that kind of treats the predictions as cer as certain, uh, so certainty equivalent control, and the idea is you know then you take your predictions, you you know optim compute your action as, you know optimally based on the predictions. Uh, implement that action going forward. And MPC works great in terms of consistency, because if the predictions are accurate, it's going to be optimal or near it. Uh, but it's terrible in terms of robustness. And you can see that with a, you know, this is a like drone trajectory planning problem. Uh, and so you can see here, for example, you know, the uh, if perfect if predictions are perfect, you can follow the trajectory very well. But if predictions are very noisy or adversarial, then, you know, trajectory planning just doesn't go very well in, in like classical MPC type implementations. So, you know, this makes, I think, very salient, uh, you know, why you need both uh, in this sort of world. Okay, and so going on now, the the this framework has really emerged since 2018 uh, with some work by Vasilis and, and uh, his collaborator here. And the first paper was in the context of online caching in the online algorithms world. Uh, and since then, it's been really applied in a wide variety of settings in the online algorithms and online learning world. Uh, you know, ski rental has gotten a lot of attention because it's simple, and uh, and the ones here are the ones that in our group we've been uh, working in detail on that I'll tell you some about today. Um, but it's really emerged as, I think, a powerful way of trying to get guarantees on top of, you know, learning tools, basically. Uh, and so my goal today is really to give you uh, not, you know, a full detailed picture of how proofs work in this space, but to give you a sense of how algorithms are designed in here and a sense of what the type of guarantees you can get for you can wrap on top of, you know, say deep RL uh, using uh, this sort of technique. Uh, and we'll do that with mainly the first two examples, uh, convex body chasing and online optimization. And I'll mention just briefly uh, control uh, an application there. Uh, but, you know, really my goal here is to give you a sense for algorithm design and what complexity there is in the algorithmic design uh, for, this type, for this tile of K experts combination algorithms. And so the first context that we'll look at is a very simple and classic uh, online algorithms problem called convex body chasing. And I'll talk a little bit about applications in a second, but for now, just think of you know, the cartoon illustration. So think of some high dimensional space and you're choosing actions in this high dimensional space. And at every point in time, you're given some safety set. Uh, think of this as like the actions you can take at any given point that, you know, satisfy the safety constraints for your system. And so you have to play an action in that region. Uh, but at the same time, you want to be smooth in your actions. You don't want to wildly change your system configuration every time. And so the cost you, play, you pay is the distance uh, between your current action and your uh, next action. Uh, and so at a, and this repeats, you get a new body, new convex body uh, that you want to choose a safe action within. You then move to that action and you want to minimize your cost uh, between these actions. So that's the problem. And so your total cost that you're trying to minimize is just the sum of these distances. Uh, and uh, what makes it hard is that you don't know future bodies when you're making a decision of where in the current body to place yourself. If you knew the future body, you could place yourself in the current body to minimize your total distance moved. Uh, but since you don't know, you have to be a little bit conservative uh, without you know, thinking, especially in an adversarial sense, uh, thinking about where next bodies might be. Because if you are aggressively go to one side, then the next body will be on the other side and you'll pay a cost. And so often you end up in an adversarial sense wanting to move to somewhere near the center of these uh, safety sets. So like I said, this has a long history, uh, you know, for over four decades at this point with lots of uh, very interesting results along the way. It's gotten uh, a lot more attention in recent years, uh, in part because of applications to control, uh, where if you 
want to, and this is these are three papers in this particular direction from our group uh, that I think are, are, you know, I can point you to in more detail later on if you're interested. But, but the idea here is, suppose you're trying to control a system, but you don't know the dynamics of the system. You need to learn those online. Well, then the body captures in some sense the set of uh, dynamics that are consistent with what you've observed. Uh, and so as you learn about the system, the body that you need to be within uh, is shrinking because you have ruled out more and more potential dynamics. And so you have what's called a nested convex body chasing uh, problem where the sets are all within the previous one. Uh, and this, this nested convex body chasing problem captures your adjustment of uh, estimation of what dynamics could be possible for the system. And so if you want to do robust control or safety control, safety, you know, safe control, you need to be robust to this new nested convex body problem as you do it. And so there's some nice techniques that combine algorithms for convex body chasing with robust control to get, you know, provable guarantees uh, in context where you are learning the dynamics on a single trajectory, but still needing to have safe control. Uh, and so that's been a really, uh, I guess, nice uh, uh, example of applying, deploying these things where we actually have been able to deploy it in sort of voltage control and other applications uh, for safety critical systems. Um, but then on the algorithmic side, it's also gotten a lot of attention in recent years. And, and the, the best results to this point are due to uh, Sebastian Bubeck and Mark Selke and their collaborators. Uh, and they kind of go along the lines of what I suggested already, which is that in this domain, if you want to be good in an adversarial sense, you need to be conservative and you need to always be moving towards the middle of these bodies. Because if you move too much to any side, uh, the, you can, the next set might force you to move more than you should have needed to. Uh, and so the Steiner point is one notion of the center of a body. And so moving to the Steiner point turns out to be a very good algorithm that's nearly optimal. Uh, so the best guarantee you can get is root D independent of T, but you know, you're almost uh, optimal here. There's a log T factor away from being optimal uh, with the Steiner point algorithm. Um, but you know, the point for, for the purposes of this talk here is that there are good uh, trusted algorithms known but that they are really conservative. And so advice can be really powerful in doing better. And so to drive that point home, let me go back to that same example I had before. And suppose we had a black box AI giving us suggestions and that was a really well-tuned uh, you know, black box. And it just suggested we move to that point. And you know, once we were there, we could stay there. And so we would be way better than the conservative move to the center of these bodies. Uh, because we would just move one point and then we could stick there and be in everybody coming in the future. And so, you know, with the right predictions, the right advice from the AI tool, uh, we could do much better than the conservative worst case trusted algorithm. Uh, but of course, we could also do much worse if the advice, you know, led us astray and kept guessing that things were going to, you know, be near the boundaries of these sets. Uh, and so you really want to take advantage of the advice where it's good, but also keep your robustness guarantee in cases when the advice, when the advice is bad. Uh, and so this basically begs the question uh, here algorithmically of, you know, you have these two, you know, if we have trusted and untrusted advice, you have two places giving you advice and which one do you follow? How do you decide when to follow one or the other? Is it enough to always follow one or the other? Uh, and so our first attempt here at, you know, giving a sense of how algorithms like this work uh, is a very classic kind of uh, online algorithms approach where we are just going to follow the two advice devices and we're going to try to kind of ensure that we don't follow any one for too long. Uh, and the way we'll do that is to, to limit the total cost we can incur while following any given algorithm. And so, you know, walking through this a little bit to give you an idea of why this simple algorithm works very well. So in the first step, we, we know we have to start off by following the untrusted advice, because if the untrusted advice is good and we don't follow it right away, uh, then, you know, the adversary can really make us pay for following the trusted advice. And so we have to follow the untrusted advice first, but we don't want to follow it for too long in case it's bad. And so we're going to follow it for a certain amount of cost incurred R. And then we're going to switch to the trusted advice and follow that for this for cost R. And this is good because, you know, if the trusted advice is really good, we're going to spend a long time in step one. Uh, and if the 
uh, and much less time in step two. Whereas the trust, if the untrusted device is really bad, we're going to spend a very short time uh, in step one and a much longer time in step two. And so this inherently biases towards you know the right direction. Then yes, the question. Yeah. So it seems like I will follow. I will do trusted advice first because if the untrust is really bad, you doom from the beginning. So it's kind of counterintuitive to me why you will want to follow the untrusted advice first. Yeah, so it, there is that sense. So, so if, but if the, uh, I guess, you know, if we, if we, yeah, that's true. So the untrusted advice can hurt you for one time step uh, if you start with it, because if it hurt, if it's really bad, it's going to be much better than, bigger than the threshold. And then you're going to stop following it for a long time. Uh, and so then you're going to follow the trusted advice the rest of the time. Whereas on the alternatively, if the trusted, untrusted advice is really good, uh, then you've immediately lost uh, consistency if you don't follow it and you'll never be able to catch up. And so if you care about consistency, you have to follow the untrusted advice first. And there's gonna be, as you make, as you point out, there's gonna be a necessary trade-off between these two because the fact that you're following untrusted advice first means that you'll pay a price in terms of your robustness guarantee because it can hurt you that one step. Uh, but you know, so there's there's a fundamental lower bound which we'll get to that says how you can trade off between robustness and consistency. Yeah. Um, good. So that's that's the first point. And then, uh, I have, I have yeah, question. go for it, so, so, when you say tr you follow the untrusted advice until the total distance is R, and then from R to two R, you follow the trusted advice, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so yeah, total distance is two R then. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I write R like, in I should say like in step two, but yeah, that's right, so two R, yeah, um, that's right. And so you've, you've incurred cost two R approximately uh, by the time you get to step three, and then you double and repeat and double and repeat, double and repeat. Uh, and so it ensures you never spend too much time in any one region compared to the total cost you've incurred uh, as the algorithm. And you know, two things to point out here, the, the first one, which I'll emphasize a couple times throughout the talk is, this algorithm doesn't care what AI tool you're using. It doesn't care how it's being adapted online and the in, in the sample path or anything like that. And it doesn't care how your trusted advice works at all. Uh, and then to optimize this, you need to be smart in how you set these R. So they shouldn't actually be the same thing. How you set R should depend on the guarantee of the trusted algorithm. And it should depend on how much you want to bias towards consistency versus robustness in terms of these trade-offs. So like Ben said, like if you if you don't care as much about consistency, then you know you set the time you're spending or the cost you're incurring relatively in step one to be much smaller uh, and the cost you're incurring in step two to be much larger, for example. And so you can bias towards consistency or robustness with that ratio. Now to the out to the result, the type of result you can prove. The, this is why I start with this simple algorithm, is because you know you can get a. This is sort of the ideal result you'd hope to prove, right here. And so this is a result for the nested convex body casing case, and here uh, this algorithm gets a one plus delta consistency bound. So that means you know that it's never much worse than the black box AI could have been. Uh, and you get a D over delta robustness guarantee. Uh, and remember D is sort of the best you can hope for for the uh, body chasing uh, guarantee anyway. And so you're matching up to a constant factor, the robustness guarantee, and you're matching up to a you know, small de delta uh, what the performance of the black box AI could have been. Uh, and so, and I should say, this is work with uh, two of my students, Nico and Tanache. Uh, and you know, I, the, the way to interpret this is really you're getting now to use your black box AI algorithm, whatever it is, and you're getting a guarantee that's nearly as good as you could have had with uh, you know, uh, any algorithm, any online algorithm, uh, and you know, on top of it for free, basically, because you've wrapped it in this simple switching wrapper. Um, Okay, so questions about this, because this is our first uh, kind of result here that give you a sense of what's to come. Will of course improve from here. Sorry, I missed. What is D here? Oh, sorry. Thank you. I meant to say that D is the dimension of the problem. Uh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. I should have said. I meant to say that in the body chasing. So, uh, yeah, the dimension of the problem. 
So this is sort of roughly speaking, it's like the doubling trick. So yeah, yeah. So this is the doubling trick in this context. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Ben. Yeah, I can wait until later. You should decide. Like there's symmetry in this your formulation consists in robustness, but then you you're really saying that I have to do the untrusted advice first, which seems not there's a symmetry. So why can't I just start from the trusted advice? Just do as well. I don't yeah, so yeah. It, it, we should we should uh, uh, go more in detail into the technical to make it exactly clear why. But at a, at the highest level, it's it's because we want to prioritize this one plus delta consistency. Uh, we really want to be able to do basically as well as the black box AI tool. And if you start the other way around, you can't get that. Uh, that like I can show you it in math, but you know, in in a sentence, that's that's the reasoning. Um, Okay, so going on then. So this is, this is the warm up. So this is for the nested case. Uh, so when we go to the more general case, now things get more interesting, and it turns out there are some fundamental limits we can start to identify. Uh, and so here for the general case, no switching algorithm uh, can have any sort of robustness guarantee, any competitive ratio that's you know not infinite, while being less than three consistent. And so, you know, given that the goal of this is to basically put a wrapper on our black box AI so that we can get a guarantee and not give up performance, it says we have to give up a factor of three performance if we want to wrap a robustness guarantee uh, on these algorithms if we limit ourselves to switching algorithms. And so this pushes us to think of more general algorithms and other ways of, you know, doing this combination. Uh, and here's now uh, a, a, a still simple, but uh, slightly more complicated way of doing it, uh, which is basically to take advantage of convexity of the sets, the bodies. Uh, and so just hedge between them. Uh, so choose some convex combination of the trusted advice, the blue point, and the untrusted advice, the green point. Uh, and basically do this adaptively so that you kind of go towards the untrusted advice and then move either more or less towards the un, towards the trusted advice depending on how well uh, the two algorithms have been doing on this instance and so you know more concretely like if the uh, untrusted advice is better historically on this instance this cost up to time t uh, then the you know untrusted advice then there's no reason to use the untrusted advice just follow the trusted advice otherwise Follow the trust, follow the untrusted advice, uh, but step a little bit towards the uh, trusted advice. Where how much you step towards the trusted advice depends on the relative costs of the algorithms up till this point. Uh, and this is a fairly complicated uh, dependency, so I didn't write it out. Um, but you can imagine that you know you want to be closer to the untrusted advice if the untrusted advice is doing better, and closer to the trusted advice if they're similar in cost. Um, and so this is this is the uh, approach. Uh, and you know, still, while this is more complex, complex, it still doesn't care how the trusted or untrusted advice is being constructed. We're not going into any of those details, which I think is the power of of this uh, you know K experts view on. Uh, getting these guarantees. And the result you can prove in this case then looks like this. So for the general body casing, this interpolation algorithm gets a root two plus delta. So not quite as good as one plus delta uh, and an O of the dimension over the delta squared robustness where again, we, we're not quite as good as in the nested case. We have a delta squared here instead of a delta, but this is still a constant factor times what's the best possible uh, guarantee you can have uh, uh, for our robustness in this setting. Um, and so, you know, just emphasizing that, like adding robustness does in this case seem to mean sacrificing some performance of the black box AI. Uh, we don't know if this root two is fundamental or not. I do think that it, there's something larger than one that will be a fundamental limit, but it would be interesting to try to characterize exactly where that limit is. Uh, and similarly, we don't know if this delta squared is a fundamental limit on the robustness side uh, or not. Uh, and so there's some nice, interesting open questions here uh, still to look at. But, you know, my goal here is not to delve entirely on, on you know, this particular model framework. Uh, it's to sort of highlight this approach. And, you know, one thing that, you know, this so far we've seen is, 
you can't get away with just using simple switching algorithms and doubling tricks. You have to do something a little bit more. Uh, you know, maybe there's even more complex algorithms that can do better than the one that we just presented. The area is really new, so I, I think lots of these questions are still wide open. But you know, one structural thing that was needed there, you know, to do this adaptation, you needed to be keeping track of the costs historically of the various algorithms, and so this memory. Uh, was really key to knowing whether to follow the advice or hedge. Uh, and so again, a, a sort of structural algorithmic question is, is memory needed uh, to benefit from this sort of untrusted advice uh, on top of the trusted algorithms that, that exist? And so to look at that, we'll go to the online optimization framework. Uh, and so here uh, in online optimization, this is online optimization switching costs. It's very similar to the uh, nested body chasing problem, except now instead of a body, you're given a cost function e in each round and you pay your cost on the cost function. And then like before the distance that you move the switching cost. And so then on the round two, you get a new cost function, you pay your cost on that cost function, you pay the distance you move and so on. And so now instead of just having the movement cost, you have what's called this hitting cost uh, additionally that you incur each round. Uh, and like before the challenge, uh, the thing that makes this hard to do well in an online sense is that you don't know what's coming. Uh, and since you don't know what's coming, you don't know whether it's worth it to move to the minimizer or whether it would be better to just pay a little bit in hitting costs now to avoid that movement cost. Uh, and, you know, because the next cost function might be where you're standing now. Um, and so that's that's the problem. And this, again, has a huge literature over you know, many decades. Uh, and this is something that in our group we've been working on a lot in the last decade. Uh, and we've now been you know, pushing applications of this to sustainable data centers, to video streaming protocols, uh, for example, with Amazon, for uh, EV charging, uh, and for camera tracking in sort of NBA games where you have the camera moving and you don't want it to move too much at any given point in time, but you want the ball to be in the center of the screen. So there's lots of exciting applications of, of this particular online framework uh, and motivated by applications. There's been a lot of work in terms of algorithmic progress and, and like in uh, body chasing, I'll just summarize the state of the art. Uh, and so at this point, the state of the art is for cost functions that are alpha polyhedral. So where the slope around the minimizer is, is bounded by alpha, uh, lower bounded by alpha. Uh, in the convex case, you can get an O of root one over alpha competitive ratio. And this is tight. This is best possible for any online algorithm. Uh, and in the non-convex case, uh, you're stuck with very simple algorithms, greedy, move to minimizer algorithms, and those can get sort of order one over alpha, or I guess two over alpha, but order one over alpha competitive ratio. So slightly worse, you know, square root alpha worse than the uh, convex case. Um, so I'm summarizing many, many, many papers in the space with just uh, sort of state of the art today, uh, because the, my key point here is that all of these algorithms that come out of that literature are very conservative, like in the body chasing world. They all end up staying pretty close to the minimizer of each function each, each round. But of course, if we had predictions, we could do the same thing as we could in the body chasing world and you know, be told it's not worth it to move, just move to this point and stay there forever and do much better uh, in terms of our cost. But of course, the same sort of advice could be wrong and could be telling us it's worth it to make a big move now because you're going to be able to stick there uh, and take advantage of it. And you know, then uh, that be the wrong decision and you end up paying a lot of costs because of those movements. Uh, and so you, know, you want to be able to take advantage of the advice to improve your performance, but you need to be robust to bad advice uh, in these sorts of situations. And so here we can go through a similar thing. And here, it's interesting because of the uh, non-convexity. I'll show you the results there. Uh, in the non-convex case, uh, you actually are stuck with switching algorithms because if you try to do some sort of hedge in between, uh, then the cost function could have a big hump in between to sort of near to local minima. minima uh, and then you could be really punished for trying to hedge in between. And so you're stuck with switching algorithms. Uh, and in that case, uh, so this is work with uh, some folks at Georgia Tech and my student Nico, so Don and Deb at Georgia Tech. And here we can give an adaptive switching algorithm of a similar flavor, but more complex than the one I showed you for the body chasing world, where we get this sort of trade off. And here, you know, what's, you know, I guess the first order point is this again gives us a way of making use of 
uh, black box AI and giving them a robustness guarantee. But you'll immediately notice that this robustness guarantee is a lot less appealing uh, than the one that we had in the body chasing scenario. Uh, it's exponential in the uh, delta for your, your consistency guarantee. Uh, and that means that you know, you're paying potentially a lot in your robustness guarantee if you want to be really close to the performance of the uh, black box AI. Um, but we can show that that's necessary. So this is this is just a harder problem to do well in terms of robustness and consistency. There's a there's a sharper trade off uh, between the two uh, in this context. And so this is, in fact, the optimal trade off uh, for this scenario. Um, and so here, though, I want to make sure I, I, I know I'm getting close to the hour. Uh, I want to uh, give you a really concrete example here uh, in the context of data center to close data centers to close the loop. And so coming back to my data center setup where I showed you the simulation results at the beginning, uh, we're going to take uh, you know our, our carbon centric data center with on site solar and storage. The ML tool here is a is a deep learning uh, tool that we've trained to really do you know as best as possible in terms of predictions, uh, and the experiment is to then do you know impose a distribution shift between uh, training and testing, and the non ML based algorithm is the you know the best uh, online algorithm with the best guarantee uh, that exists uh, today in this setting, and what happens when you run our adaptive online switching algorithm is you get that goal that I showed you earlier. You actually have something where if there's no distribution shift, you're getting that one plus delta bound uh, compared to what you would have gotten with just using the black box AI directly. So you're not suffering much in, in that case, you're getting consistency, but you're getting even better than the theory would have suggested robustness guarantees in the case that there's distribution shift. And so this huge uh, risk that you take if you implement it without this wrapper on top goes away, and this simple switching based wrapper on top ends up, uh, you know, avoiding that risk that you, you know, is today necessary to take when you're deploying these things in safety critical systems. Um, and so this this was really exciting for us when we saw this, um, and. It is a little bit of a cherry pick, though, so I want to be completely uh, forthcoming here, and so this was a particularly chosen delta. Uh, of course, the delta is free. It's a parameter that you have to select for the algorithm how much you want to bias, how much you want to bias towards consistency versus robustness. And so, depending on how much you want to bias, uh, you can still have, you know, you can limit your risk more or less. Uh, and this is something that right now has to be selected for the application. Um, of course, it's it's not that hard to select, but it has to be selected. And uh, you know, this coming back to the theorem, this says like, you know, am I willing to take a you know, 1.5 consistency guarantee so that my robustness guarantee is better. How do I select that trade-off parameter between consistency and robustness? And of course, the, the goal here would be to not have to have the designer set that, but to have that delta learned adaptively online during the running of the system. Uh, and in the online optimization case, we haven't yet been able to prove something about algorithms like that. But this is where I'll very quickly mention uh, control. So in, in the LQR setting, where we have a linear quadratic control, linear dynamics, quadratic costs, uh, then we can actually prove something. And so we can prove a that you know you can adapt delta using a follow the regularized leader sort of approach. Uh, and this you know then is a way of tuning. I see your question in the in the chat, Tamer. Uh, this is exactly the way we're using to tune uh, the delta online through the instance. And not only can we use the algorithm to tune, but we can prove then a guarantee that doesn't depend on a choice of delta anymore. It depends on the error of the untrusted predictor. And so the epsilon is a notion of error for the untrusted trusted predictor, and the mu var is a notion of the variance of that prediction error. And so you can get a guarantee that depends just on the quality of the prediction because you're adapting the delta. And you know, graphically, what that ends up doing is it ends up selecting the lower envelope of all the delta. Uh, and so you get a best of all worlds from that follow the regularized leader approach in the case of LQR. And so uh, you know, a big open question is, can we do something like that in the online optimization case and the on convex body chasing case? And so that's something that we're really working on right now. 
Um, and so to show you the LQR case in action, these were the trajectories I showed you before for MPC uh, on you know, this drone tracking problem. So this is you know, dynamics to mimic uh, a drone tracking problem where the drone is not aware of the trajectory and learns the trajectory online. Say it's tracking some uh, you know, movement of some other thing, uh, observing it. And you know, here is the algorithm now. So this is really, really noisy predictions. You can see how much they destroy MPC's performance. And then you can see the performance of the, you know, just the wrapper on top of the predictions. Now, all of a sudden, you still have some bounces away from the trajectory, but you're basically able to follow the trajectory nearly perfectly, despite getting terrible advice from the black box AI. And so you're really getting a strong robustness guarantee. And of course, if the predictions are right, you're following them precisely still. Uh, and so you're getting consistency and robustness in the tracking problems and, you know, more generally LQR type control problems. Uh, and we have some very new work that actually shows you can extend this out of the linear setting and still in some nonlinear dynamics have similar results. Um, okay, so one last result and then I promise I'll stop. So, so this was, I, I wanted to say just memory. So all of that stuff, learning the Delta adaptive online switching still requires memory. And in this case, actually we can show that that really is fundamentally necessary. So if you don't use memory in these sorts of algorithms, you can't do any better than you could have if you ignored the untrusted prediction entirely. And so mathematically, what that means is if you want any constant robustness guarantee, any non-infinite robustness guarantee, uh, then if you don't use memory, the best consistency guarantee you can have is this one over root alpha, which matches what you could do without, you know, just with a standard online algorithm, not using any predictions at all. Uh, and so if you, don't use memory, you can't do better than just ignoring the predictions entirely, uh, you know, no matter what algorithm you're using. Uh, and so I think really it highlights that you need the can basically you need the complexity that comes from uh, memory. Now we don't know how much memory you need. You might not need as much as the algorithms that we're proposing at this point are using. Maybe there's other algorithms that can be more efficient with this information you need to maintain. And I think that's a really interesting open problem. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll go over that. And, and, and I guess the last result I was going to say is, you know, there are some situations, some simpler situations where you can get away without memory. So for example, this fundamental limit depends on being in two dimensions or higher. In the one dimensional case, you actually can, uh, you know, have a memoryless algorithm that gets an ideal guarantee. Uh, and that's a, actually a very relevant case for some of the applications I mentioned. Uh, and so this is this is a very nice result. So in some situations, you can be simpler, but in the general case, you really need to go beyond switching and you really need to go, you need to use memory uh, in these algorithms. Okay, so I'll wrap up at this point. And, you know, my goal wasn't, you know, to particularly, you know, uh, tell you all the details about these particular applications, but rather to use them as examples of what I think is a powerful framework for adding guarantees to black box AI tools. Uh, and so, you know, I hope that this idea of consistency and robustness and combining trusted and untrusted experts in these wrapper algorithms to achieve consistency and robustness is something that intrigues you. That's the goal of the talk. Uh, you know, the talk results focus mainly on how complex those wrappers need to be. Uh, you know, they need to use memory, they need to use switching. What else can we do? Uh, it's a really new area, so I'm sure there's lots of algorithmic ideas that we haven't come up with yet in the community. Uh, and so I hope others will jump in and, and bring new ideas to the field. Uh, this idea of adapting to the quality of untrusted experts, I think, is really important. Uh, another one, you know, with coming back to some of the questions in the beginning, that's really important is to say, you know, what if the untrusted expert doesn't just give you an action that you should do, but gives you some uh, certainty or quantification of the quality of that prediction. Can you use that to improve the performance of these wrappers and get better bounds on better trade-offs between robustness and consistency? Uh, and then the big one is really, you know, I've talked about this in the talk, is if there's one expert that's trusted and one expert that's untrusted, but you could clearly have many different untrusted experts and you could have trusted experts that certify different things. So you could have a trusted expert certifying robustness in the way we talked about today. You could have a different one that certifies stability. You could have a different one that certifies stability, uh, or sorry, safety uh, in some sense. And you know you want to be able to combine multiple trusted experts with multiple untrusted experts to get the guarantees and best of all worlds uh, with this sort of wrapper. And that, you know that's the really the big picture vision here. Uh, and then you know tying uh, you know one more thing here in terms of the model free model based. You know all of the trusted expert designs assume that you have some model, but if you have to learn that model online, then there's you know, somehow 
an idea that you're learning the trusted expert as you're combining it with the untrusted expert. And that makes this even more complicated to think about. And we have some ideas on how to do that that I'd be happy to talk with people about if you're curious. Um, but I'll end there and just say, I, you know, I hope that this framework sounds appealing to you and that you're interested in reading about it. Uh, I think there's a lot of you know, exciting applications and also exciting kind of algorithmic questions that are in the uh, open for in this field right now. And if you want to learn more, here's our papers in the space that can be a starting point. So thank you. Okay, um, thanks. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Um, so uh, if you have questions, you can unmute yourself or ask to in the Q&A. Srikon? Yeah, nice talk, Adam. Um, so I, I have a question about the last part of your talk about the LQ part. Um, mm -hmm. I guess, so what happens, I guess you chose a problem where uh, full state information is available. What happens if, uh, uh, you know, y equal to cx plus du kind of thing, uh, or, or I guess there is a whole line of work in the control literature recently, starting with the work of Nejmi uh, on, on uh, system identification. So you assume, if I understood it correctly, you assume the A and B matrices are known. And yeah. also you have perfect state information. So that's right. So it's the it's the intro result. Uh, all of those questions are really interesting. The the secondary results that we're going after are not those yet. Uh, we're going after the results on uh, nonlinear dynamics right now because the applications we care about those are that's like the biggest thing. Uh, I, in a different line of work that I, I, I'd love to talk to you about, actually, uh, maybe you know next in a next talk that I give uh, at UIC. Um, we're, we've been working a lot on that kind of uh, approaches beyond system ID for instead of learning the dynamics, learning the policy directly and oh, what can be, what's the sample complexity for going after things like learning the policy directly. And, and we have some ideas there. And that last little arrow I drew that was uh, meant to sort of be like, can we combine that kind of a literature with this sort of a wrapper uh, where you've learned the, the model enough to know what your guarantee is and now you're going to treat it as trusted, and you know have a full pipeline that combines these things. Uh, but but that's kind of you know, years ahead vision, right? not something we're doing actively right now. Yeah. But I, I, if I understand you correctly, so traditional RL typically doesn't do system ID; they directly learn the. So so you're trying to compare what happens if you if you directly learn the policy versus doing system ID followed by the policy and trying to say something about the sample complexity of both. Yeah, so for example, in the, 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 the uh, to give you a concrete structure of results, like the, the application of convex body chasing to this problem, uh, we, we don't learn uh, the dynamics. You use the convex body to represent all dynamics that are consistent with what you've emerged what you've seen. Uh, you don't care about that, that set converging to a singleton. Uh, you care about using a policy that's robust to whatever the diameter of that set is currently. Uh, and so you have that feedback between the robustness of the policy you're applying and what you know about the system dynamics. And each is, you know, the, what you know about the system dynamics is improving. And, and this gives you much better sample complexity because, you know, if the system is self-stabilizing, you don't need to learn anything. You're just fine from the get-go and the model never makes mistakes. And you only have that uh, update uh, when there's a mistake made, when you violate your safety constraint or when you violate your performance guarantee that you're requiring for robustness. And that leads, that triggers then the update for the convex body chasing, which then uh, reduces your consistency set. And with that style of combination, you can actually prove like finite error mistakes, uh, even on single trajectory situations where you don't know the dynamics and it's a nonlinear system. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, Ben. Yeah, so I want to go back just to clarify what you said. So my understanding that is asymmetry starting from the untrusted is because of proof. So I would believe that if you use a different technique, you might actually see the symmetry. Yeah, that, that, I, I won't rule that out. Uh, I think every, every question that I answer in this field right now is like, this is what we understand today. This is, you know, two years into uh, a type of question. Um, and I think, you know, to, to sort of build on it, uh, the there's definitely connections in some applications to some of the like bandit uh, K experts literature where you can apply those techniques to get results. So I've seen that in, for example, the metrical task system work by Antonio Adas uh, last year at, at NeurIPS. Um, but 
those have been few and far between so far. For the most part, there's been something to be gained by taking advantage of the particular guarantee that you're going after in terms of trading off consistency and robustness and the particular uh, guarantee you assume you have for the policy in terms of these competitive uh, guarantees for the algorithm that you're starting with as trusted advice. Uh, and so I think there's, there's a, yeah, so it's, you know, take everything I say with a grain of salt, but uh, you know, I think there's some differences there that are quite interesting to explore. But just a guarantee, I feel like probably worth pointing out that theoretical guarantee is not practical guarantee. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so I think we hear a lot about guarantee and there are conditions. And then you're talking about data centers, so that's real. So I would yeah. say there might be situations that you know the untrust is better just because the theoretical guarantee doesn't say anything exactly about practice. That's a great that, that's a great point. And and you know, the the guarantees you know that we've been going after in our theory work are completely adversarial. And so they uh, it tends to be that they're too conservative in what they enforce. And you saw that in my like results picture for the data center case where you know the robustness bounds or the robustness performance that we saw in practice was way better than the exponential bounds that would the theorem would have that the theorem provided. Uh, and so it tends to be that you do even better than the theory suggests with your guarantees. Thank you. Very nice talk. Enjoyed it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Adam. Um, I also have two questions. Uh, one yeah. is the clarification one. So for the first switching algorithm, I I was wondering uh, if this R chosen adaptively or it is uh, uh, decided before the algorithm starts. Um, and in the yeah, in the most sophisticated yeah. algorithms, it's adaptive. Okay. Uh, so it adapts to the performance uh, and the incurred cost on that sample path. Uh, and that's crucial to getting the tight bounds in, in all the applications. Uh, yeah, the second, uh, the second question is, uh, in the applications you mentioned, uh, did you find there are uh, specific scenarios or application areas uh, where um, they trusted, where eventually you assign all the weight to the trusted or the untrusted uh, expert? eventually? Um, that's a great question. Uh, not so far, um, but you know, there, there tends to be a limit. Uh, you know, I could imagine maybe a situation where the untrusted gets most of the weight, but you don't want to give it all because if you give it all, then you lose the guarantee entirely. And so, so you're never, you know, unless things are really in, in theory world running infinitely, you'll never be in a situation where these algorithms give all the weight to the untrusted because you know, you're going to give up too much, uh, you know, in the in the infinite case, maybe you would get close to that because you'd have an infinite cost that you'd incurred already. And so you couldn't handle it. But in the in any practical scenario, you'll never, you'll never be running that long. Uh, and so it won't you won't really end up at an extreme point uh, with the algorithms as we've developed develop them so far. There might be better ones that uh, would be more more quickly, more quick to adapt in that way. Yeah, I see. Um, so, for example, like if you have a scenario that is uh, very tractable, like very simple, that you can actually compute the optimal, for example, optimal control policy for that simple environment, uh, is that the case that the trusted uh, expert actually can beat the untrusted one? I guess that would be the scenario where the trusted one is the most competitive. Yeah. So, I mean, the the when you the question, I guess, inherently in that is. Uh, what what are you giving the optimal algorithm? Uh -huh. So uh, you know the I'd say you know the the optimal algorithm is going to have some you know and, and if you think of just like LQR, it's going to be an optimal algorithm that doesn't use predictions of mm -hmm. the noise for the system. If you were to give perfect predictions, uh, it would do better, uh, right? And so the if the black box has you know, figured out a way to have near perfect predictions, uh, and it's using those, the like untrusted bound with the robustness bound won't be making use of the predictions because the predictions could be way off. Uh, and so in the control, like to make it really concrete, like to get a robustness guarantee in the LQR setting, you can't use the predictions because they might be way off. Uh, and so the black box has those predictions. So you can have the optimal algorithm, uh, but not using predictions and compare it to the AI, which is using those predictions mm -hmm. to discern. And so it's, you know, depending on the quality of the predictions, one will be better than the other. I see. I see. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. Thanks, everyone, for attending the talk. Uh, yeah, thank you, Adam. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Talk. Bye, Adam. Thank, thank you, everybody.